This short lecture covers FISA pen trap orders. Pen registers and trap and trace devices were added to FISA in 1998, then overhauled by Section 214 of the USA Patriot Act. That's why these are sometimes called Section 214 orders. In intelligence lingo, they're often dubbed PRTT orders. And since the pen trap provisions are Section 401 of FISA, as amended, they're also sometimes called Section 401 orders. They're all the same thing. The way these orders usually work is very, very similar to ordinary pen trap orders. A federal agent submits a certification and proposed order to a judge on the FISC. The judge then reviews the materials for compliance with FISA's pen trap requirements. Those requirements are pretty rock bottom, much like the requirements for a pen trap order under ECPA. Assuming the agent hasn't goofed, the FISC judge issues a pen trap order. Then, the investigator serves that order on a telecom. And the telecom provides some assistance in obtaining prospective communications metadata. The recipient of the order could also be an email provider, of course, or an internet service provider. Just like an ECPA pen trap order, a FISA pen trap order applies to all forms of electronic communications. FISA even borrows ECPA's categories of information. Just like an ECPA pen trap order, a FISA pen trap order covers dialing, routing, addressing, and signaling information. And it doesn't cover content. I'd like to highlight four key differences between ECPA pen trap orders and FISA pen trap orders. On the ECPA side, the information obtained from a pen trap order has to be likely relevant to a law enforcement investigation. On the FISA side, that information has to be relevant to a counterterrorism or a counterintelligence investigation. That standard does get relaxed, though, if no U.S. persons are involved. On the ECPA side, we saw that a target doesn't need to be notified of a pen trap. If criminal charges are filed, prosecutors do usually disclose the use of a pen trap, but that isn't a statutory requirement. On the FISA side, notice is required for a pen trap if information from the pen trap is going to be used as evidence or as a source of evidence. That requirement may only apply to the pen trap target, though. The executive branch has taken that position in recent litigation. Back over to ECPA, we saw that there is no opportunity to suppress unlawful pen trap evidence. Investigators would be criminally liable for violating the ECPA pen trap provisions, but the resulting evidence would still be admissible. On the FISA side, there actually is a suppression remedy. If a person is unlawfully surveilled with a FISA pen trap order, that person can move to suppress the pen trap evidence and derivative evidence. Once again, the executive branch position appears to be that this right is only afforded to the target of a pen trap order. Back to ECPA. No court has authorized a bulk surveillance program with the ECPA pen trap authority. And I don't believe the executive branch has claimed that it has the authority for a law enforcement bulk surveillance program using ECPA's pen trap provisions. On the FISA side, bulk surveillance actually has been allowed. The executive branch has argued for it, and the FISC has authorized it. In fact, the National Security Agency's first court-authorized bulk domestic surveillance program was operated under FISA's pen trap provisions. In a 2004 opinion, Judge Kolar Kotelli of the FISA court authorized bulk collection of internet metadata under FISA pen trap authority. We're going to look at that program in the next part of the course. For now, I want to emphasize the extraordinarily questionable statutory interpretation that the executive branch proposed and that the FISA court accepted. The ECPA and FISA pen trap provisions are very similar, and their drafting strongly suggests they're both about targeted surveillance. There are all sorts of statutory hints, including references to specific persons and specific communication systems. And, of course, both ECPA and FISA require that information be relevant.
The mere relevance standard is low, to be sure, but it still doesn't cover everyone. Nevertheless, in an opinion that was not declassified until 2013, Judge Kolar Kotele allowed bulk surveillance. She noted substantial deference to the executive branch in national security matters, and she bought some very strained readings of what a pen trap is and how the relevant standard functions. In closing, I'd like to share some data on FISA pen trap applications. I want to be sure to note that this is a very limited reflection of bulk surveillance under the pen trap authority, but it does lend some insight into individual pen trap orders. I'd like to emphasize two features in the graph, both very similar to what we saw with FISA wiretap orders and physical search warrants. In the years following the September 11th attacks, FISA pen trap orders greatly increased. Then, after the executive branch received the Protect America Act and FISA Amendments Act surveillance authorities, FISA pen trap applications dropped off. That's likely because those new authorities were easier to use, and in particular, didn't require individual judicial authorization. So, that's the story on FISA pen trap orders. In the next lecture, we're going to look at a different type of order under FISA for accessing business records.